Distinguished delegates, colleagues, thank you very much for rejoining us for today's second panel. We were off to an excellent start already um, with a very, very interesting discussion on, um, with our opening panel, of course, but then also on the use of armed force in cyberspace. So we now have uh, the pleasure to turn to our, our second thematic uh, panel on armed attack and self-defense in cyberspace, um, essentially UN Charter Article 51. Um, I'm very, very pleased to have been invited to moderate this panel. My name is Catherine Preisman. I'm with the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs. Um, and we have a very distinguished panel with us um, here <coughs> this afternoon. We will first hear um, an expert briefing from our colleague from UNIDIR, um, Mr. Andras Kastelik, um, who will lay out basically the, the major um, substantive points that we'll be tackling today, which I think we'll all benefit from. And then we'll move to our very distinguished panel um, and hear first um, some elaboration on national positions related to the law of armed attack and self-defense. And then we will hopefully have a, a further round of um, some open questions that I will pose to, to panelists who wish to chime in a second time. And then we'll certainly have time for question and answer. So with that, I would like to uh, first turn to, um, to Andy to, to provide us the, the contextual setting. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Catherine. One thing you can uh, put the slides on, if you don't mind. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction and for giving me an opportunity to brief the, um, this panel, this, uh, the second panel on the law of armed attack and uh, um, self defense. The briefing, I, I understand it will be very short. I think we were running over time in the past panel, but I'll try to keep it to, to a very short 20 minutes. And because of that, uh, please excuse uh, certain nuances that I will forego in my, in my um, briefing. That's, that's just in the interest of, of time, but happy to discuss um, later if need be. Um, so in this short briefing, I'll try to introduce not only the existing doctrine of the uh, armed attack and self-defense, but also some of the international discussions, the relevant international discussions that have been, have been uh, tackling this topic, as well as, to an extent, divergences or some of the open questions that come from the, the analysis of the national interpretations of the particular part of the law. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, <clears throat> as you can see on the, on, the, on the screen, and as Catherine already mentioned, Article 51 says, says that nothing in the present charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs. Now, there are two elements in, in, in this. I, I don't think I bolded, or yes, I did. Um, there are two elements uh, to, to this um, article that I would like to specifically focus on today. So obviously, the, the, the first one is self-defense, but I'd like to start actually with a question of an armed attack, which is sort of a precondition of of self-defense, at least according to the, to the Article 51. Now, next slide, please. Thank you. Now, not all force is equal. We were talking about, in a previous panel, we were talking about Article 2, Paragraph 4, so use of force. In the next panel, I'm assuming the discussion will revolve uh, the, the concept around the concept of aggression as well. And um, this time, this panel about armed attack. Now, there's this distinction between these concepts, even though maybe on, on a surface they seem different, but um, it's not just um, a legal, legal exercise or a legal debate that is sort of um, self-serving, what is the difference between these, these, these principles, but it actually matters when it comes to the consequences. I believe Robert in the, in the previous panel was talking about the, some of the responses that states have in their arsenal, I suppose, of possibilities um, to the use of force. Um, and this, this obviously, we're talking about self-defense is slightly different here. And self-defense is uh, much different than countermeasures, which are non-forcible, or retortion, that is unfriendly act, and so on and so forth. So you can see that the stakes are much higher here. And consequences, indeed, depend on the classification. So <clears throat> now, at least according to the doctrine and jurisprudence, uh, I think I put ICJ 86, that's a famous Nicaragua case that we've heard about today already. Um, 
sort of posi positioned these two, at least the use of force and armed attack in a sort of cascading uh, relationship, saying that there's a difference between the most grave forms of the use of force, those constituting an armed attack, and on the other, uh, on the other hand, other less grave forms. I believe they, they, they mentioned them small, smaller or um, yeah, smaller um, border disputes or incursions. Now, there is a threshold or delineation, at least according to jurisprudence, between these two, um, these two uses of force. So plain use of force, as I, as I may call it, and, 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 and an armed attack. But there also is a bit of a tension, I suppose, between the understanding of the states between um, th these two concepts. And there are a number of states that perhaps, not perhaps, there are a number of states that equate any use of force with an armed attack, and by virtue of that, allow themselves or reserve the right for, for um, self-defense. Self now, um, one thing that may come particularly um, under scrutiny is the, the, whether, whether, whether cyber operations can actually constitute an armed attack. Now, I'm not going to do, go into details here, but the two different understandings of the, of the armed attack um, Pertaining to pertaining to the um, uh, means and methods versus the effects of the of the whatever deed it is that may be qualified of a, of an armed attack. Now, I, I'd like to refer to again what we heard today already a couple of on a couple of occasions is the nuclear um, nuclear weapons advisory opinion by the ICJ that has I think not only I think we talked quite a bit about IHL but also talked about generally about international law that it's, that it's, and specifically about a UN charter that is neutral, a technology neutral, meaning that it does address also um, any, any future weapons or prohibit any, the use of any future weapons when it comes to the use of force as well as when it comes to the armed attack and subsequently um, self-defense. Next slide, please. Now on, on self-defense, this is going to be slightly longer. I, I talked about the armed attack. Now the consequence, or uh, yeah, the consequence is 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 the permission of self-defense, at least according to the law. This is one of the this is one of the two exceptions that charter permits states to use force. This is the second one is Article 42. We'll talk about that again in the in the second panel. But nonetheless, the, 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 the Article 51 is not a new, is not a new right uh, that, that has been given to the states. This has been a customary right that has only been codified in, in Article 51, but it has been repeatedly, repeatedly, um, I suppose, emphasized by uh, jurisprudence as well as member states, uh, as well as UN member states in their individual posi uh, positions. We're still outside of the context of, of, of cyber for now. Now this is, mind you, this is an extraordinary um, countermeasure, not, not a countermeasure in a legal sense, but it's an extraordinary reaction, I suppose, and is very, very limited to these um, exceptional situa situations, I suppose, that, that weren't, um, weren't um, the, the response in self-defense. There are two requirements uh, embedded in the, in the Article uh, 51 itself. So one is the procedural requirement, the other one is the temporal limit of the of the self-defense. So first, when I talk about a procedural requirement is that any, any self-defense taken by, by any of the UN, members, um, UN member states have to be um, reported to the Security Council immediately. That's at least what the, 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 the article says. The second one is a temporal limit. So states, states can only take a resort to self-defense uh, self until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. Now, whatever that is, but um, I think these two actually play, play well, pretty well together, sort of the procedural requirement to report to, to the Security Council as well as the temporal limit. Now, two things that are sort of of customary nature or two, two conditions that are of customary nature and are not, not um, embedded in, uh, at least not explicitly in the Article 51, are the necessity and proportionality. You can go, give you, next slide, please. Mm, yeah, thank you. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So these are the customary, when I say customary requirements, they have been widely recognized by the, the, the state positions as well as the, again, international jurisprudence, mostly by the, by the ICJ, again, referring to nuclear advisor opinion, Nicaragua case, and, and similar. I don't want, don't want to list, because it might be boring, but when it comes to necessity, um, as the court stated in Nicaragua case, it must be, when it comes to self-defense, it must be, not that it's just tends to protect, or it may protect the essential 
um, security interest of a party that takes the self-defense, but it must be seen as necessary for, for that purpose, so for the purpose of self-defense, which I will return in, in a second. So, and then on the second, the, the second um, condition here is the proportionality. This is not limited to the, to the quantitative equivalence to, to, to the attack. So it's not apples to apples. It's not a bomb for bomb. But uh, proportionality must be expressed in the, it, it must be expressed in relation to the, to the objective. So um, I put, to, to restore legal and factual relationship between states, but a, a colleague pointed out that that may be um, unclear. So essentially, it must be proportional to the, again, to the purpose that the self-defense um, um, right actually permits, meaning that it can go as far, but also can be quite low in its intensity as long as it achieves the objective. Objective, when I, when I talk about the legal relationship, so restoration of compliance by the state that has been accused of, um, of an armed attack, and on the other hand, um, the factual, if possible, in cyber, that might be a bit different, but to restore the factual relationship that was before. So what, 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 what happened was before, before the armed attack even occurred. So hence, the non-forcible options are also on the table. Okay, and then collective uh, self-defense, I wanted to, to quickly mention this because it might be, might be contentious, particularly in light of uh, the debates on collective um, countermeasures, but there are doctrinally at least um, three conditions that must be, must be um, fulfilled before a collective, collective self-defense can be, can be taken. So on the first occasion, um, state that has been targeted by an armed attack must declare that it's been targeted by an act that is it sees or it uh, interprets as an armed attack. It must issue a request for assistance to a third state or a number of states. So states can't just join self-defense um, actions um, by their own choosing. They need to be asked to do so. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, states under attack must also be party to the self-defense actions themselves. So um, it's not permitted, at least not according to the traditional understanding of the law, to completely outsource the, outsource the, the self-defense. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now, a question that might be quite quite contentious and I'm aware of that, but I still want to go through the possibilities of possible interpretations of, of the law nonetheless. That is the one of preemptive or anticipatory uh, self-defense. Now, strictly reading the law, strictly reading the Article 51, uh, one would say that it is completely outlawed, given the fact that Article 51 says, you know, self-defense is only allowed if an armed attack occurs. I believe I bolded that here, yeah. And indeed, uh, ICJ has, has sort of nodded to that and agreed uh, late, lately in the 2005 um, um, judgment related to Congo. But I think, that, or I may be argued that new technologies, new methods of delivery, and particularly what, what might be interesting probably in cyberspace is the question of speed of violation that may occur or speed of armed attack in this particular case. Um, certain states have, uh, have said that they reserve a right to anticipatory preemptive or preventive self-defense. Now, there are certain nuanced differences between all these three. I don't want to go into details. But um, nonetheless, um, even, the, even the Secretary General, the former one in, in his 2005 report, said that imminent threats are fully covered by Article 51. So there are interpretations of Article 51 that uh, permit or see uh, artic uh, yeah, uh, Article as permissive of anticipatory, preemptive um, self-defense. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now moving on to, 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 uh, to cyber and Article 51 in the multilateral discussions, relevant multilateral discussions, so GG and OAWG. Uh, I don't want to repeat, but nonetheless, it has been very clearly um, expressed already that United, the states have agreed that the United Nations Charter applies to ICT domain. But Article 51 has never been mentioned in, in, in the reports of the GG or GGEs or OEWG. Nonetheless, um, the, the, I think the, the text of all the reports or agreements have been very clear that um, 
uh, charter applies in its entirety. So there's no, there's no way or there's no reason to believe that Article 51 is excluded from that. And the, the latest GG21 report has been very explicit that, you know, inherent rights of states to take uh, um, measures consistent with international law and as recognized by charter are allowed in cyberspace as well. I think that is, the language is very similar to Article 51, so one would assume that this is it. Now, when it, when it comes to way ahead, as I put it on, on the slides, states are going to continue, um, I'm assuming, discussing Article 50, 51 in self-defense in, in, in the future, perhaps already as soon as next week. So the 2022 OEW annual progress report has called for focused discussion. We heard that already today. I don't want to repeat that, but nonetheless, on how the international law applies. And, and Article 51 has been mentioned in one of the outstanding issues uh, I'd like to refer you to um, the chair's summary of 2021 OEW report that has explicitly mentioned that um, states would like to, some states have raised the questions related to the discussion on the Article 51 and raised the need or expressed the need for, for further clarification on how that body of the law applies in cyberspace. Now, I promised a bit of um, some certain divergent positions and, and, and convergent positions in order to illustrate um, what what the elements of that, how international law applies in cyberspace may be, may be in need of discussion in the, not only next week, but also, also in, in, in the future. Now, rightfully so, I understand that this part of the law is quite, might be quite contentious, um, and great prudence is, is probably warranted in, in, in these discussions. So I think it comes with no surprise that a lot of states in their individual positions have, have warned against the automatic or uh, automatic application of, of that particular body of the law or under the great deal of assumptions, um, I think the discussion indeed might be, might be in order. Now the first, the first uh, difference that I noticed when I was going through these individual, uh, individual interpretations was that I think states haven't really fully agreed whether cyber operation can indeed constitute an armed attack. There are certain states that believe that this cyber operations can just never, simply never can qualify as an armed attack. <clears throat> the, second, the, que the second question, I think, or the urgent uh, issue might be of one of the thresholds. So the threshold between the use of force and an armed attack, as I mentioned before. Now, there, there are certain predating interpretive uh, divergences. Um, as I mentioned already, certain states equate these two, these two um, notions. So that will probably, uh, again, come, come on, on the table in the cyber domain. It's not the first time we heard actually today discussing, uh, I think Maria uh, Ambassador Leto mentioned that there are certain, certain outstanding issues in the interpretation of the charter and they will come out um, also in the discussion on cyber. But I, I, I think majority of states, nonetheless, do distinguish between lesser and greater um, use of force, meaning between uh, armed attack and, and uh, use of force and armed attack in, in, in cyber domain. <clears throat> Most of states um, argue that use of force to qualify as an armed attack would have to be relatively equivalent to, um, to, to, to the one conducted by traditional um, kinetic means. Now, in this case, we've heard already, scale and effects are an, an, important, an important element of analysis when trying to understand whether uh, use of force indeed reached the threshold of Article 51 or not. Now, <clears throat> states in giving examples have, um, have, have come to say that death and injury, uh, death and injury or substantial material damage caused by a cyber operation will constitute an armed attack, and by virtue of that, they reserve the right to, of, of, um, of self-defense. Now, on the other hand, we also have states that argue um, that considerable physical or economic damage could constitute self, uh, sorry, armed attack as well, which is sort of different to, to the traditional doctrine that I, I mentioned before. But nonetheless, um, certain states do interpret the law in cyber domain as such. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Um, now, when it comes to perpetrators, uh, there were quite a lot of questions online um, during the past panel on the use of force and non-state actors. Uh, states, states, obviously, I, I fully understand that in the ICT domain, in the ICT context, that might be quite a popular um, area of, of um, discussions. 
the states have uh, talked also in their uh, interpretations on the, about the perpetrators and what happens if, if non-state actors are involved in a cyber operation that they deem to be to have risen, I suppose, to the to the threshold of Article 51. Now, in cyber domain, again, states interpret the law um, or, or say that on, on a number of occasions that non-state actors can indeed perpetrate also an armed attack, which is something that we have not seen in traditional understanding of the doctrine, at least. Uh, once again, I understand that maybe that's, that's just the nature of cyber. The next, uh, the next uh, I suppose, divergent uh, positioning that I want to um, bring your attention to is um, on, on the proportionality. So the first ones, uh, I'll leave in the interest of time. So um, when it comes to proportionality, I, I did mention, if you recall, that the doctrine calls for self-defense in proportion to the intent of the self-defense uh, or the objective of self-defense and not to the, to the initial wrongdoing, which being an armed attack. Nonetheless, certain states in, in applying the law to, um, to ICT domain argued that the, the self-defense needs to be comparable to scope, scale, and duration of the initial armed attack, which again is the interpretation, even if a bit um, contradictory to, the, to the, um, the traditional jurisprudence. So I believe that it's quite likely that the discussion will have to go also in the, the, uh, into the questions of proportionality when it comes to the questions of international law in, in cyber. And then uh, the, the last one, uh, probably the most contentious is the question of the, again, preemptive uh, self-defense. A number of states have argued that um, they reserve the right to take, uh, to, to take self-defense action to imminent armed attack through or in cyberspace. This uh, seems to be quite pervasive throughout a whole, um, the whole spectrum of international interpretations of the law in the ICT domain, so I believe that this is something that states need to um, start discussing as well. That's it. Thank you very much. I hope I was on relatively on time. Thank you very much, very, very much, Andy, for this extremely useful um, overview. I myself was furiously taking notes. Um, extremely useful on a, a very difficult, po politically sensitive, but also legalistic question, which is what we're also trying to unpack here today, is the, you know, the nuts and bolts of what applicability in this space uh, means. So <clears throat> I'm now um, very pleased to turn to our distinguished panel of colleagues who will reflect on their respective national positions related to the law of armed attack and self-defense. So I would first like to invite the acting director of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation, the Department of International Information Security, Mr. Artur Lukmanov, uh, to join us, uh, I believe, virtually. Yes, hello, uh, good day, uh, good evening, good morning to all those following you virtually. Uh, thank you for introducing me, Ms. Uh, Prideman. Uh, many thanks to uh, Mr. Kastelik for his briefing, a very interesting one. Um, for me, the invitation to speak at this conference is an honor. I plan to participate in person. Uh, the host country refused to issue a visa without explanation. This is yet another breach of the agreement between the United States and the UN to host United Nations headquarters. I urge colleagues from UNDA to bear this circumstance in mind when choosing venues for future conferences. It would be preferable to organize them in a UN member state that does not get in the way of multilateral diplomacy. Russia has strong reservations over the agenda proposed by the Institute, and we shared uh, those uh, with uh, good friends uh, at this uh, uh, at UNDA. We have reservations on the applicability of international law to information space. We see uh, this discussion uh, as an attempt to, to predetermine the course of international discussions on ICT security. The agenda is presented in line with the approaches of a group of certain countries. 
it is common knowledge that they want to legitimize the use of ICTs for military and political purposes. To bring the world closer to so-called cyber war. The applicability of international law and moreover of international humanitarian law is one of the aspects of the open-ended working group agenda. So far, there is no consensus on this matter. There is no understanding on the subject of discussion. Are computers, smartphones, or other means of communications, transmission or storage, a weapon? Can a set of rules or equations, computer program, or a phone application be considered as such? If so, what about the internet that, let me put it blindly, is controlled by one country and its corporations? What about satellite constellations of that country used by the military for military purposes? I had to uh, uh, introduce some amendments to my address and draw the attention of you dear to the unacceptable as assessment on the part of Under Secretary General Izumi Nakamitsu, who brought up a political issue war in Ukraine as a reason of less stability in information space. The stability of information space depends on every state, but primarily, to our mind, on the developed nations. They control ICT domain with their developers, technologies and providers. They try to apply their laws on others under the banners of freedom of speech, priority of privacy, or gender agenda. All these calls are ridiculous, given Snowden's and Wikileaks revelations, investigations into the use of ICTs by Western intelligence for espionage, blackmail, and sabotage. I return to my uh, uh, speech, which I prepared before. I had to make this amendment because of the unacceptable, I repeat it again, um, assessment on the part of Under Secretary General. International consensus exists only regarding the applicability of universally accepted principles of international law to the use of ICTs. We have a number of uh, United Nations General Assembly resolutions, 73 slash 27, 75 slash 240, and relevant reports of GGE in 2015 and 2021. So these principles are sovereign equality, non-use of force or threat of force, respect for the territorial integrity of states, settlement of international disputes by peaceful means, non-interference in internal affairs, fulfillment in good faith of obligations under international law and interstate cooperation. Bearing this in mind, we call for support uh, for the Russian initiative to develop, to further develop a global intergovernmental points of contact directory that will allow for constructive interaction, help, build, trust, ease tension. This initiative was presented by Russia within the open-ended working group in July. We have now good discussions on this issue and hopefully we'll reach some good results. In our view, it is unacceptable to talk about the automatic application of existing norms of international law, including the UN Charter and international humanitarian law, given the specifics of ICT. The norms of international humanitarian law cannot be used to assess the legality or illegality of the hostile use of ICTs in peacetime, since those are applicable only during an armed conflict. We consider it necessary to focus on the development of criteria 
for qualifying the use of ICTs for purposes inconsistent with the purposes of ensuring peace and security. Any further discussion on this issue is heavily complicated by the problem of reliable identification of sources of computer attacks. The global communication network does not allow for an equivocal confirmation of such. It is necessary to adhere to the principle of the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 73-27, I quote, accusations of organizing and implementing wrongful acts brought against states should be duly substantiated. Responsibility for incidents in information space cannot be attributed to anyone without evidence. Organizational and technical mechanisms for the anonymization must be agreed upon to objectively identify sources of computer attacks and dissemination of illegal information. The majority of countries insist on the use of ICTs for development and prevention of conflicts. Guided by these goals, 112 UN member states voted in favor of UN General Assembly Resolution 77-36. It is aimed at shaping a global system of international information security based on legally binding instruments. I would like to echo here what uh, Ambassador Gafur uh, mentioned pre previously, that we need such, uh, and we need to move forward to reaching this instrument. It could be a universal convention on international information security. We are going to share our views in a relevant concept paper at the upcoming OEWG session. Russia seeks to prevent incidents in information space from escalating to the level of armed conflict. We reserve the right to respond to computer attacks on national critical infrastructure. These provisions are enshrined in our doctrinal documents on defense and deterrence, which in the area provide for decisive measures in the event of hostile impact on critical infrastructure of the Russian Federation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lukmanov. Uh, very, very much appreciate your participation remotely, um, making the time. I'm sure it's not the most convenient of hour in Moscow, so very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, I would now like to turn to Mr. John Riles of the Cyber Policy Coordination Staff, the head um, of the German Federal Foreign Office, to elaborate on the German national position. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, UNIDEA, for organizing this conference on this crucially important issue and for facilitating much-needed dialogue among UN member states on the application of international law in cyberspace. And let me state that um, Germany would like to reaffirm the full applicability of international law to cyberspace. This conference is a very timely initiative, both with regards to the current state of world affairs that Under Secretary General Nakamitsu referred to in her opening remarks, but also in view of the agenda of the open ended working group that starts next Monday. The mandate for the open ended working group covers the question of how international law applies in cyberspace. And it is good to see that we will have a focused discussion on that important agenda item at our meeting next week. Before diving into the questions of armed attacks and the right to self-defense, I would like to underline that the UN Charter has received explicit reference in all GGE and open-ended working group reports since 2013. As part of the acquis, member states 
have repeatedly reaffirmed that the UN Charter is applicable and essential to maintaining peace and stability and promoting an open, secure, peaceful and accessible ICT environment. Discussions on the application of the rules of the UN Charter are therefore highly welcome, as well as an excellent starting point for discussions on the application of international law in cyberspace in accordance with the principles and purposes of the United Nations. Let me also mention in this regard the Canadian Swiss concept paper, which was recently published and which Germany fully supports as a very helpful quest, set of questions to be addressed in the further work of the open-ended working group. Let me now outline the German position on the interpretation of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter in cyberspace as laid out in our national position paper on the application of international law in cyberspace that our ministry has published in March 2021. Let me first say that the vast majority, majority of malicious cyber operations fall outside the scope of what we define as the use of force. We are seeing immense malicious cyber activity on a daily basis be it crime-related or espionage-related. However, cyber operations might in extreme cases fall within the scope of the prohibition of the use of force. In that case, a cyber operation would constitute a breach of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter, which reads, all members of the United Nations shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. And I'm reading this with a particular emphasis on the political independence, as this is a dimension that is particularly sensitive to cyber attacks at a time when essential government services are increasingly moving online, and at a time when key democratic processes, such as elections, also go online. Let me quote from a statement by the International Court of Justice that illustrates Germany's position very well. The ICJ, as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, has stated in its nuclear weapons opinion in 96 that Carter provisions apply to any use of force regardless of the weapons employed. And this has been mentioned before um, by my previous speaker from, from Canada. Um, we'd like to to also state, since, and, I, and I apologize if this is slightly repetitive, but I've been asked to give my national position, so I will, I will need to say this. Um, Germany shares the view that with regard to the definition of use of force, emphasis needs to be put on the effects rather than on the means that are being used. Cyber operations can cross the threshold into use of force and cause significant damage in two ways. They can either be part of a wider kinetic attack. In such cases, they form a component of a wider operation clearly involving use of physical force. In this case, they can be assessed within the examination of the wider incident. Secondly, outside the wider context of a kinetic military operation, cyber operations can by themselves cause serious harm and may result in massive casualties. So Germany follows the view that we need to assess the scale and effects of cyber operations. And it's important to keep in mind that there is no easy or fits all way of determining whether a cyber operation has passed the threshold of a prohibited use of force. This is a decision that needs to be taken on a case by case basis. Based on the assessment of the scale and effects of the operation, the broader context of the situation and the significance of the malicious cyber operation, this all needs to be taken into account. So which effects do we actually need to look at when we make that case-by-case -case assessment? Germany's position is that we need to look at all reasonably foreseeable effects. For example, an attack on an energy grid leading to electricity blackout, leading to patients dying in hospital, this could cross the threshold. The Italian manual also mentions the example of an attack against a water purification plant. If people die, drinking contaminated water, that again could also be a case 
that crosses that threshold. Which criteria play a role in this assessment? We would focus on the severity of the interference, the immediacy of its effects, the degree of intrusion into foreign cyber infrastructure, and the degree of organization and coordination of the malicious cyber operation. Now let me briefly talk about the right to self-defense. In what kind of situations can this right be exercised? The right to self-defense, according to Article 51 of the UN Charter, is triggered if an armed attack occurs. Um, and I'm not going to go again through, through that definition. We've, we, we've crossed that. Um, but let me say that, of course, there needs to be a transborder element. This is given if a state engages in a cyber operation against another state or if a state directs non-state actors to act on its behalf. Then we look at the scale and effects that would qualify the incident as an armed attack. And then we take a decision, is this a situation where the right to self-defense is given? This decision is not made based only on technical information, but also after assessing the strategic context and the effect of the cyber operation beyond cyberspace. There is a reporting obligation under the UN Charter. The decision whether we are dealing with an armed to discretion of the state that has become victim to such a malicious cyber operation, but it needs to be comprehensively reported to the international community. It means to the UN Security Council, according to Article 51. The inherent right to self-defense can only be exercised until the Security Council has taken the measures that are necessary to maintain international peace and security. The response to malicious cyber operations constituting an armed attack is not limited to cyber counter operations. Once the right to self-defense is triggered, the state under attack can resort to all necessary and proportionate means in order to end the attack. Self-defense does not require using the same means as the attack which have provided the trigger for its exercise. How about cyber operations that have not been carried out by a state. Acts of non-state actors can also constitute armed attacks. Germany has expressed this view both with regard to the attacks by Al-Qaeda and the attacks of ISIS. When we apply this to cyber operations, if these are conducted by a private contractor whose activities are attributable to a state, this could qualify. Take the example of private mercenaries if provided with malware by a state and trained in order to perpetrate cyber attacks, this would qualify as an armed attack by a state. Let me limit my initial remarks to this and I'll, I'm happy to come back to, to aspects of this topic later on in the discussion. Thanks uh, very much indeed, um, Mr. Riles, for the useful um, and condensed uh, overview. These, all these issues are are so important and, and very uh, technical legalistic, so it is difficult to um, fit into our timelines, but I think we're, we're touching on many important aspects. So now, uh, without further ado, I will turn to uh, Ms. Maite Schmitz, the head of the Division of Sea, Antarctic, and Space, the Department of Defense, Disarmament, and Strategic Affairs of Brazil. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Catherine, and uh, let me also start by thanking UNIDIR for organizing this event, for promoting <clears throat> a technical discussion on issues that will be part um, of next week's discussions from, from what I'm hearing, and also for the kind invitation to speak today in this panel. Uh, this is not only a very important topic, but also a very challenging one, as we could also assess from hearing previous interventions. Um, law will often be outpaced by scientific innovation, which in turn, needs, uh, which in turn tends to generate considerable uncertainty about the application of certain international norms. And legal uncertainty, particularly in the realm of peace and security, can lead to insecurity and increased risk of conflict. And this is a concern for us. In many discussions about international law, we always see a question on whether the existing rules are enough to regulate a certain area of life, or whether more needs to be done. And more often than not, the responses to this type of questions, they adopt an all or nothing approach. 
So either the existing norms are enough and therefore there's no need for further legal development or no, the legal framework is incomplete and there is a need to develop new law. And I believe that the Brazilian national position on, on, on the application of international law to ICTs um, does not adopt the sort of all or nothing approach, but it rather says we are not operating in the vacuum. We can use the existing law to regulate behavior in cyberspace, but at, at the same time, we might need further clarification and further regulation. And this is very clear in our national position because we start, we start from this point. Uh, we say that in their use of information and communications technologies, states must comply with international law, including the UN Charter, international human rights law, international humanitarian law. And at the same time, we recognize in our national position that for the sake of clarity and legal certainty, we might need to further develop some legal norms. Given the broad scope of international law, our national position focused on some key topics of, particularly, of particular relevance, one of which was the issue of the use of force, the one that is the focus of this panel today. And I commend UNIDIR for promoting a discussion on this topic, because from the many discussions we have had so far, this one on the law of armed attack and self-defense in cyberspace is one where more legal certainty is needed. And it is also one where if states have very divergent interpretations on the law of what is permitted and what is prohibited, for instance, then we run the risk of escalating conflicts with very devastating impacts. And starting from the very basic, for Brazil, the legal prohibition on the use of force in international relations is applicable, uh, the, 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 is applicable in the cyberspace, is applicable for ICTs. And this is we have been saying this is a peremptory norm to which, as been explained before, only two exceptions are permitted, self-defense and authorization under Chapter 7. The UN Charter does not refer to specific weapons or other means of use of force, so therefore, and therefore the legal prohibition, of course, would apply to all of them. Uh, and this is based also on what has been said on, on, the, on case law from, from the ICJ. And coming to the, one of the questions that has been posed for today's panel, if uh, whether the cyber operation that do not cause immediate physical destruction or loss of life amount to an armed attack. I'd like to return this question with a similar one, with a similar question. Can, I con can a kinetic attack that do not cause immediate physical destruction or loss of life amount to an armed attack? And I believe this would be our starting point for discussion. And, of, and for us, cyber operations may amount, for Brazil, cyber operations may amount to an illegal use of force if, one, they are attributable to a state, because for us, armed attack is an attack that is perpetrated and attributable to a state and not to a non-state actor. And second, if the impact is similar to the impact of a kinetic, kinetic attack. And I couldn't agree more what has been previously said that we need to be cautious as well in terms of analogy here. Um, it's generally understood that to date, no state has claimed that the rule prohibiting the use of force was violated due to a cyber attack. Um, we have been some, some, some discussions, but it's generally understood that not crossing that threshold. And the lack of this precedent in terms of threshold reinforces the need for much caution when making analogies between cyber and connected actions in assessments related to use at Bella. We're using here many expressions to discuss actions that are not necessarily the same, and as we said, we've seen that before, violation to the prohibition to the use of force, armed attack, aggression, crime of aggression, there are many issues, and uh, for us it's very clear that we are talking about different um, legal terms with different characteristics. So when discussing the international law and the use of force for cyber attacks, we need to keep those very distinctions in mind. Um, I know that the next panel will discuss uh, aggression, but just to have some reference, there are in the list that we see some, some, some actions that would qualify as aggression, invasion of territory, military occupation, bombardments, uh, blockade of ports uh, or coasts uh, by armed forces, among others. So when we see that, uh, we realize that it might prove difficult to establish a direct analogy between the acts 
that, is li that are listed there in Resolution 3314, which is the one for aggression, and cyber operations, because cyber operations have very unique characteristics. So uh, for us, it would be very advisable to reflect upon the multilateral understanding of which acts amount to the use of force and which acts amount to aggression, which is even uh, graver, so as to include instance of cyber attacks. Um, being very cautious and being very careful in what, uh, about what we're talking about and about the effects of the, the, the attacks. And why and it might be challenging to find consensus on gray areas, and one of the gray areas is the one that we are discussing here, the characterization of digital attacks with no direct physical effects, which is very challenging, and I, I would say that we see that very, with great caution. But there are points of convergence that should be consolidated multilaterally to provide more clarity and more legal certainty, which is a very important aspect. Um, I hope my time, okay. <laughs> oh, five minutes, I can't finish this. Um, and amongst the gravest forms uh, of the use of force and, and international relations, of course, we have cyber attacks. And they trigger the right of states to resort to self-defense in accordance with Article 51 of the Charter. Self-defense is an exception to the general principle on the prohibition to the use of force. So for us, it needs to be interpreted restrictively. This view is in line with the case law of the International uh, Court of Justice, principal judicial organ of the United Nations. So when we're talking about sometimes non-state actors or preemptory and anticipatory self-defense based on a secretariat's document, for us, our guidance is the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice, which is very restrictive. So to close, how do we combine both discussions? on whether cyber operations that do not cause immediate, immediate physical destruction or loss of life amount to an armed attack, and which are the available responses, or what can we do in terms of self-defense. And I would say that for us, one of the main concerns here is that on one hand, we see some, some movement towards considering cyber operations that do not cause immediate physical destruction or loss of life as an armed attack, then triggering the possibility to resort to self-defense. And on the other hand, there is this growing understanding by some member states that states can use conventional weapons and exercise the rights of self-defense in case of cyber attacks. So basically, we would be lowering the threshold to characterize a cyber operation as an armed attack while possibly increasing the level of response. And sure, this is not automatic, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. The discussions for us to what amounts to use of force in the cyber realm and what amounts to a cyber attack, it, they are or they should be directly link, linked to the limits for self-defense, always keeping in mind the need to follow the principles of necessity and of proportionality in self-defense. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Schmidt, and uh, apologies that I let my timer go off, but uh, just trying to do my <laughs> due diligence as moderator <clears throat> to keep us on track. But thank you very much for um, your extremely interesting presentation of, of the national opinion of Brazil, really <clears throat> pointing out um, several critical issues I'm sure will be uh, interesting for some follow-up. But let us move then to our, um, our final panelist today, Ms. Bryony Daly-Whitworth, um, who will be presenting um, on the Australian position. She's the Director of Cyber Affairs and Critical Technology Branch of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I want to thank you, Nadia, um, as well for hosting uh, this uh, event, this panel. I agree wholeheartedly with John. This is very timely, these discussions, uh, and also with um, Maete, uh, that this is a very difficult but important discussion um, where deepening understandings and more legal certainty is very welcome. Uh, I'm very honoured to be here today to uh, elaborate upon Australia's position in relation to the law of armed attack and self-defence in cyberspace. Australia has published our public positions on how international law applies to cyberspace uh, several times. We've made four public statements since 2017. And I think this is an example of how uh, the law is, uh, the clarification of the law is um, advancing. We're deepening 
um, and, and we take steps slowly um, and carefully towards deepening and clarifying and advancing um, our collective understandings of how international law applies in cyberspace over time. Uh, both Andres and John have, have mentioned, um, and I want to reiterate uh, that Australia also reaffirms um, that the international community has recognised that existing international law, and in particular the UN Charter in its entirety, is applicable to state conduct in cyberspace, and that it is essential to maintaining peace and stability and promoting open, secure, stable, accessible uh, ICT environments in cyberspace. Uh, and that this uh, um, uh, recognition and, and this re reaffirmation comes from the 2013, 15 and 2021 Group of Government Expert Reports and also the 2021 OEWG report. Uh, Australia considers that existing international law provides a comprehensive and robust framework to address the threats that are posed by state-generated and state-sponsored malicious cyber activity, and it provides victim states with a toolkit to identify breaches of international legal obligations, uh, attribute those acts to the responsible state, to seek peaceful settlements of disputes, and where a victim state deems appropriate, and it is permissible under international law, to take lawful measures in response. Turning in particular to armed attack and self-defence, the Charter of the United Nations requires states to seek peaceful settlement of disputes under Article 2, and it helpfully provides states with guidance in this regard. It requires parties uh, to a dispute to seek solution by negotiation, by inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, um, resort to regional agencies or arrangements and other peaceful means of their own choice. And this is all set out in Article 33. With states having agreed that the UN Charter in its entirety applies to cyberspace, there's no question that this obligation extends to cyberspace. States are required to resolve cyber incidents peacefully without escalation or resort to the threat or use of force. However, Australia also notes that as a matter of international law, this requirement to settle disputes peacefully does not preclude a state's inherent right to act in individual or collective self-defense in response to an armed attack, nor the injured state's right to take lawful countermeasures or other lawful action. And this inherent right to self-defense, individually or collectively, applies equally in the cyber domain as it does in the physical realm. Australia considers that the thresholds and limitations that govern the exercise of self-defence under Article 51 apply in respect of cyber activities that constitute an armed attack uh, and in respect to acts of self-defence that are carried out by cyber means. This means that we see that the cyber element can be relevant to the exercise of Article 51 self-defence in two circumstances the originating act that constituted an armed, an armed attack and also the responding act in self-defence. So first, if a cyber activity alone or in combination with a physical operation results in damage or presents an imminent threat of damage, and that threat or actual damage is equivalent to a traditional armed attack, then the inherent right to self-defense is engaged. And second, regardless of whether an armed attack was committed by cyber means or by traditional kinetic means or a combination of both, any actions taken in self-defense may be carried out by cyber means. I'll be concentrating my remarks predominantly upon the first aspect, that is when a cyber operation constitutes an armed attack, as recognized under Article 51, and the consequent entitlement to the use of force, whether by cyber or kinetic uh, traditional means, pursuant to that inherent right of self-defense. And let me be clear here that when I am talking about actions taken in self-defense, any action in self-defense, uh, Australia considers it must comply with all the applicable limitations contained in the UN Charter and in customary international law. And that is that the use of force in self-defense must be necessary for a state to defend itself against the actual or imminent armed attack. It must be proportionate uh, in response and scope, scale and duration. And any reliance on Article 51 must be reported directly to the uh, UN Security Council, as was elaborated earlier. Uh, and these customary international law limitations on the use of force in self-defense, in Australia's view, do help safeguard against the risk of armed escalation. 
Uh, turning to um, a question that's been raised um, a, a little bit about whether um, uh, conventional weapons uh, or um, physical uh, responses may be allowed to respond to a cyber armed attack, um, uh, may be used, sorry, a cyber means may be used, whether physical means may be used to respond to something that is considered an armed attack via cyber means. Australia has a firm position on this. We consider that an injured state's use of force in self-defence may be cyber in nature or conducted through kinetic means. And the right to self-defence does not require the injured state to use the same means as the attack, which provided the trigger for the exercise of self-defence. And um, Andres, you mentioned a couple of times um, about a number of states um, having positions on preemptive self-defence. Australia is one of those states. We recognise uh, that the rapidity of cyber activities, as well as the potential, potentially concealed and potentially indiscriminate character, raise new challenges for the application of established legal principles. However, we do think that existing international law exists in this regard. These challenges have been noted by Australia and we have explained our position on imminence and the right to self-defence in the context of national security threats that have evolved as a result of technological advances. And this was explained by our then Attorney General in 2017, where he said that a state may act in anticipatory self-defence against an armed attack when the attacker is clearly committed to launching an armed attack in circumstances where the victim will lose its last opportunity to effectively defend itself unless it acts. Uh, and our Attorney General gave an example. He said, consider, for example, a threatened armed attack in the form of an offensive cyber operation which could cause large-scale large loss of human life and damage to critical infrastructure. Such an attack might be launched in a split second. Is it seriously to be considered and suggested that a state has no right to take action before that split second? Australia considers that this standard reflects the nature of contemporary threats as well as the means of attack that hostile parties might deploy. And a question often arises at this point as whether Australia believes in the doctrine, doctrine of preemptive self-defence. Uh, and Australia sees actions in anticipatory self-defence through a prism of imminence. Australia supports anticipatory self-defence when the attacker is clearly committed to launching an armed attack and where the victim will lose its last opportunity to effectively defend unless it acts. However, Australia does not support preemptive use of force against threats which are not imminent armed attacks. Finally, I wanted to conclude by advocating for a more mature and transparent conversation about what states are doing in cyberspace. Australia is one of the first countries that has publicly uh, declared that we develop and use cyber capabilities offensively. Recognition uh, that states have legitimate rights to develop and use capabilities must go hand in hand with recognition that states are obliged to ensure the use of these capabilities is conducted in accordance with international law and norms of acceptable state behaviour. And when I talk about transparency, I want to make clear that this doesn't mean that there is no classification. Uh, we recognise, similar to other military capabilities, that details of specific capabilities and operations will need to remain classified. However, Australia is transparent about the existence of our offensive cyber capabilities in order to foster a more mature conversation about the rights and obligations that govern their use. And this transparency is not about taking a moral high ground. It's about recognising that there's no longer a strategic benefit in keeping the existence of these tools in the dark. And rather, there's a strategic benefit in consistently demonstrating that we respect international law and the international rules-based order and the stability for countries to determine their own future, which is provided by that international law and that international rules-based order, and that we will continue to defend it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Daly Woodworth, for a very comprehensive presentation of Australia's uh, national position and for also addressing some of the, the guiding questions <clears throat> that were uh, kindly and usefully provided by Unidir colleagues. Um, so I uh, see we have about 15 
to 17 minutes uh, remaining of the panel. Um, I would first like to give our panelists an opportunity to follow up with any additional um, elements. <clears throat> I was quite strict in my um, my time management, as you heard my, my timer. So um, I do want to make sure that uh, all the points the panelists wanted to raise um, could be addressed. And then if we have time, I'd, I would certainly like to invite some questions if any are in the room. We also have some online submission as well. Um, but first, um, if I'd like to turn it back um, to Mr. Lukmanov, if he, uh, if he would like to comment uh, further on any of the um, the issues raised or the additional elements inputted. Um, I would turn to, to you, sir. If that's not the case, oh, there you are, perfect. Sir, you have the floor. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you, really good uh, brainstorming exercise, regardless of differences. Uh, uh, I will uh, put it very uh, simple and very candid, uh, and I will repeat my, myself. ICT cannot be considered a weapon. Uh, what we can do is to prevent conflicts of the malicious, uh, out of the malicious use of ICTs. That's why we call on all UN member states to continue further working within the Open Edit Working Group on the, the initiative for global intergovernmental points of contact directory, which is aimed at bringing closer competent authorities to identify sources of attacks, of computer attacks. Uh, that's uh, crucial, that's important, given the anonymous nature we have in the information space. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the uh, additional input. Much appreciated. Thank you for, for staying with us online. I'd now like to turn to uh, Mr. Riles, if you'd like to comment further, um, in particular, uh, on this matter of um, the per permission of response and self-defense using conventional weapons, or would a response to a cyber armed attack um, only be permissible in response by way of cyber means? You have the floor. Thank you. Um, no, I mean, I think I, I already alluded to that in my previous intervention when I said that um, once the right to self-defense is given, it would open up um, the option to also um, respond by non-cyber means. So it would actually open up um, a range of response options, not just limited to cyber operations. Um, what I could add maybe are just a couple of words on the limits to the right of self-defense. Um, countermeasures taken in self-defense must be necessary to end the attack and they must be proportional, which means that excessive reactions um, are not covered. Then we also need to keep in mind that there's a time dimension. Um, the right to self-defense is only given if the attack is either ongoing or if it is imminent. And then there's the final limitation, the principle of immediacy. Um, Self-defense is not a right to retaliation at a moment of a country's choosing, choosing um, but the principle of immediacy means that self-defense needs to be exercised within a reasonable time period. And this, of course, includes the time necessary to determine the origin of the attack. And um, I'd also like to, to endorse um, the the points made by my Australian colleague about the, the right of collective self-defense, um, which is also something that um, um, Germany um, aligns itself with, um, just as it is outlined and enshrined in the UN Charter, Article 51. Um, and, um, this, and this can, of course, be done either um, based on a treaty, like in Germany's case, based on, on the NATO treaty, Article 5 um, of, of the NATO Treaty um, would be, re would be um, the relevant norm to use here, but it could also be based um, on an ad hoc arrangement. Um, it's been taken by the state that has fallen victim to an attack. So just to add these two, two elements to my previous intervention. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Riles. Very, very useful additions, and thank you. Thank you for, for further elaborating. Um, I'd like to turn to Ms. Schmitz, if you'd like to comment on any of these issues um, or expand further. Um, if I stopped you before you can complete any of your former points, uh, you're most welcome to, to add them now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, actually, I, I was able to conclude. <laughs> but uh, there is one thing that I would like to, to comment based on uh, my colleagues here that uh, have mentioned, um, the, both from, from Germany and from Australia, that mentioned the issue of self-defense. And one thing that came to my mind, and of course, it was not the focus, he, focus here of this panel, but it's, it's important for the discussion we are having, which is the issue of attribution. And, uh, we know that it's a very difficult issue that has been uh, being discussed for a long time. And, and the, the challenge is here uh, that with a cyber operation, um, technical, legal, and operational challenge, there, there are technical, legal, and operational challenges to determine um, attribution, which might make it almost impossible to verify sometimes uh, whether a use of force is attributable to a given state, and even to verify potential abuses of the right of self-defense. So, um, and then, um, in order to link to this discussion, um, I'd like to, to, to flag something that has been said before about the importance of the, the time element here, in the sense that self-defense is, uh, there is this element of time and the, the requirement to inform the Security Council promptly about what is happening. Um, and this is very important to have this information on Article 51 uh, once it is resorted to in case of self-defense so that it's uh, not by one or another state, the victim state and the, the one that is exercising self-defense, but for the international community also to assess what has happened. Um, something that we have been discussing a lot here at the UN is about uh, whether Article 51 letters are available, and sometimes it takes a while for them to, be, to become available. And, and, and with the situation uh, in which attribution is difficult, and sometimes there is no in complete transparency in terms of Article 51 letters, we might run the risk of low impact, low impact persistent unilateral action undermining the collective system that we have established under the Charter. So this is just some, some, some food for thought. Uh, I know this is not entirely the focus, but it, in fact, it, uh, it affects the discussions on the use of force as well. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for these additional comments. Um, very, very rich uh, discussion indeed. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes uh, for further uh, exchange, and I would certainly like uh, to give the opportunity for questions uh, to be posed. I do see two colleagues here in the room um, have requested um, the floor. So again, we just really encourage uh, focused questions um, to which our, our panelists could respond. Um, they are most welcome. So uh, first, I see the colleague in the back, please. Thank you, thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, if you allow, we will use, uh, we will, won't take a lot of time. Uh, it would be rather a uh, comment uh, in response to the statement from one of the panelists. I'm sorry, sir, would you uh, kindly introduce delegation yourself? Of, of Thank course, you very delegation much. Delegation of Ukraine. So we have, a, we have a statement in response to the intervention made by the uh, panelists from uh, Russian Federation. Uh, so, uh, we are taking the floor uh, in response to uh, the statement made by the representative of the Russian Federation, who uh, we didn't intend to do so, our delegation, but uh, uh, as expected, and, uh, and we are not surprised. So the representative of Russian Federation uh, used uh, today's opportunity to for political purposes to promote its pr propaganda and uh, well-known narratives which are used in different UN fora. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, he also criticized the, the event itself, its program, and but uh, what is also important for our country is that uh, uh, we, as we were mentioned, so uh, I just would like to draw the attention that uh, uh, the representative of the country which is waging uh, uh, war against Ukraine, uh, 
there is a clear legal uh, framework for it. Uh, and also, this country is waging a real wa warfare in cy cyberspace against Ukraine with numerous, numerous cyber attacks. Uh, only a, a few thousand of cyber attacks were uh, recorded uh, throughout uh, the period that uh, started from uh, uh, the beginning of the war. So, uh, again, uh, unfortunately, uh, the event was used for, uh, for uh, Russia's political uh, purposes. We had a very good discussion, uh, an expert discussion. All panelists, except one panelist, uh, were focused uh, on, uh, on the main topic of the event. Uh, but uh, the intervention of the Russian Federation, of course, gives uh, ground for different uh, conclusion, uh, conclusions, and uh, we hope that uh, such important events as this one would not be used in future for, for uh, promoting su uh, such narratives. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the intervention. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, I would like to take... Um, the questions as a set, uh, we're, we're running low on, on minutes. So I beg your indulgence to, um, to please keep your questions uh, to the panelists concise. Um, and I will take the three here uh, I see in the room uh, as a batch, and then I will allow the panelists to, to respond before we close. So um, Madam here um, on my left, Okay, Hina um, Surprise from Third Eye Legal. In the context of international armed conflict, belligerent state may resort to cyber attacks on critical infrastructure, causing significant human and economic consequences, as well as loss of critical functionality. In an ongoing crisis, it was alleged that the target state suffered significantly and asked a private democratic body called the ICANN to remove all state domains of the aggressor, which ICANN denied, stating that it would disrupt open nature of the internet. If in such a scenario, Article 51 is invoked, what proportionate countermeasures are available within the specific cyber context, including collective countermeasures to ensure peace and stability of the cyber state a space? Also in such a case, territorial integrity may not be applicable, and therefore would not a formulation of a legally binding treaty of international law of cyberspace be pivotal to ensure peace and security? Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the, the question. Uh, the colleague um, here in the back, to my, towards my left, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Dan McBride. I'm Canada's head of delegation to, this, um, to the Open-Ended Working Group. Thank you to Unidir for organizing a fantastic event. Um, I'm not a lawyer, uh, so I won't get into the legal details. My colleague, Rob Young, who, who spoke on the previous panel, did that very eloquently. Um, I just want to flag also that Canada put out a statement on how we see international law applying in cyberspace this past April, and we look forward to other countries hopefully following the, uh, the lead of, I think, 30 or, or a bit more who have already done so. Um, I wanted to strongly support what my colleague Bryony said about um, offensive cyber. Canada, much like Australia, has been very transparent about our capability. We have said that we have it in our defense policy statement also in the legislation that governs our SIGINT agency. Um, Canada proposed at the 2016-17 GGE a transparency measure that would encourage states to be similarly transparent um, as to how Canada, Australia, and several others have done. It's a transparency measure that we've been promoting at this open-ended working group as well. And we understand that there's reluctance from some states, um, but also to support Australia, we are not trying to get classified information from anybody. We are just basically saying the obvious, which is that we have a, a capability, but also like Australia, that we will only use it according to the law and the norms. The last point I would like to make, and perhaps the most important, would be to come in full support of my Ukrainian colleague on his recent remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your uh, contribution. Um, I apologize to those colleagues who have submitted questions online. I, I fear we won't have um, time to, to pull on any of those at this panel, but certainly encourage uh, the a further submission of those questions, hopefully, in the, the next panel we'll be able to, to tackle some of them. But before we close, I would um, certainly like to hear one more time from our panelists, uh, should they like to respond to any of the, the interventions and questions. Perhaps I'll go in reverse order this time. Um, so Bryony doesn't have to wait to the end. So uh, please, you have the floor. 
Thank you so much, Catherine, um, and, and thank you everyone for a, a really rich discussion. Um, I, I will try and be brief um, and address a couple of things. First of all, uh, the question around international humanitarian law. Um, it, it's a difficult one under this panel because the concept of armed attack in Article 51 of the UN Charter is very distinct from the concept of attack under international humanitarian law, which applies during uh, armed conflict. Uh, and we consider that these are separate bodies of international law, so I encourage everyone to be careful about the thresholds that we talk about um, and making sure that we keep those thresholds quite separate. So I won't be answering the question particularly because I have been doing all my homework on Article 51 rather than on international humanitarian law. Um, but I did also want to um, uh, very briefly respond to um, uh, something that's been raised a couple of times about whether cyber capabilities can in fact be used as a weapon. Australia, as, as Dan has said, um, and Canada have publicly stated that we have offensive cyber capabilities and that we use them um, and conduct uh, those um, operations in accordance with international law and domestic law. And I know I just said I don't want to conflate the two bodies of law um, uh, with um, international humanitarian law, but that is where the example that I have comes from, um, uh, because we are um, talking about um, the law, where we are talking about the law that applies to armed conflict. Um, Australia and several um, of the other state parties to the additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions of 1949, which apply um, during armed conflict, are required under Article 36 to determine whether employment of new weapons or means or methods of warfare would, in some or all circumstances, be prohibited under the additional protocol or any other rule of international law applicable to a state. And Australia uh, considers that a cyber capability could, in circumstances, constitute a weapon or means or method of warfare within the meaning of Article 36 and therefore require a review in accordance to the obligations under Article 36. And I don't think we're alone in this. I was rereading the GGE um, annex uh, a couple of days ago in preparation. So, uh, John, please jump in if I'm wrong, but I think Germany has also um, said that uh, Article 36 may apply to um, cyber capabilities as well. And, and then finally, just to conclude, um, to also align with uh, the comments made by my Ukrainian friend as well, um, Australia is committed to working with our partners and our allies to shine a light on Russia's ongoing unacceptable activity in cyberspace, and we do condemn Russia's destructive, disruptive and destabilizing, destabilizing cyber activities in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll now go to Ms. Schmitz, please. Um, if you'd like to have any concluding words, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be very brief and just uh, commenting also on uh, international humanitarian law. And um, I, I believe I've, I've mentioned that uh, before. Of course, we're talking here about two different um, regimes, international law regimes. Uh, use at bell and use in bell, and so I, I completely agree that uh, armed attack does not have the same meaning. Uh, and at the same time, Brazil has said in the, its, its position that IHL does apply to the cyberspace, and I think that is, it's important because um, we have seen this as a contentious topic uh, for a while. And um, one thing that we always uh, try to convey is that the fact that we are saying that IHL applies to the cyberspace does not mean that we are trying to bring warfare to the cyberspace, not at all. It's just recognizing the fact that if that happens, there needs to be some law applicable to the situation, and the law for armed conflicts is IHL. Um, of course, there is a lot to discuss in terms of application of IHL. I won't uh, enter into this, into this uh, topic, but just to say that uh, it's an entire different uh, discussions on definitions of armed attack and the terms of definitions of what is a civilian object and so forth. So um, coming back to the discussion on, on, on the use of force, then I believe that we are uh, even more certain ch in, in more certain um, aspects to discuss, uh, to discuss some of the legal, legal terms in which we need um, legal certainty, such as definition of use of force, the threshold, and definition of armed attack. Um, with that, let me just thank for the opportunity to discuss here and, uh, of course, available to continue the conversation in, in some, some, sometime in the future. Thank you very much.
Thank you very, very much. Um, I'll quickly move to Mr. Riles, if you'd like to have any concluding words. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, um, I was just um, thinking after this discussion that it's really shown again that it, uh, it would be worth exploring um, in the work of the open-ended working group to actually discuss um, offering dedicated cyber capacity building with a focus on international law in order to, to further our joint understanding of how international law applies to cyberspace and also in order to prepare the ground for more position papers um, to be put out. Um, if it's only 20 so far, um, I think that's really something we can build on and that would, uh, would make a contribution to, um, to shared understanding of where states stay. And um, it's been raised a couple of times now that legal uncertainty can also contribute to um, security challenges. So I think this would be also a direct contribution to, um, to increasing security in cyberspace. And with regards to, um, to the exchange we've had, um, or the, the statement made by the Russian Federation, I'd also like to say that Germany has condemned um, repeatedly malicious cyber operations led by Russia, including in the context of its war of aggression against Ukraine. And we're doing this, of course, in solidarity with the people and government of Ukraine. But we're also doing this in the interest of our own national security because we're seeing significant spillover effects on our own national networks from the cyber, malicious cyber activity. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Lukmanov, please, you, you have the floor. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, organizers, for this event, for, for the discussion. Uh, Western delegates could not stop from uh, politicizing the issue. Um, they, they represent the countries, they openly say that they use ICT for military purposes. They are the only ones, actually. They do it boldly uh, in total breach of the international law, so they should be held accountable. They say that they do it, so they, they are the main reason for a lesser stability in information rail. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your, uh, your further contribution. Um, I have only left to say thank you very much once again to all the panelists joining us here and also remotely for the very candid discussion and for the engagement here in the room and also online, as I said. Um, hopefully we'll get to some of those questions later in the day. And uh, thank you again very much, Unidir, for inviting me to participate. And I wish you a, a good lunch. Yes. Thank you.